Good morning. It's good to be home. Um, you have no idea how much I miss you when I'm not here. I talk about you all the time. I tell everybody I know about you, about the love, the care, the grace, the prayer, because I know when I pick up the phone here or in Kenya and call and say, I need prayer, you're on your face within a matter of seconds. And I don't know another single place in this country or anywhere that that happens. So I want to thank you for your love, your care, your prayers. Um, my friend Lou is with me this morning, Lou Hartman. She's a, a longtime friend. My husband and I were in her wedding, oh, about 43 years ago. And my husband was her spiritual dad. And somewhere along the way, after 25, we lost track of one another for 25 years. And then her daughter in New Zealand found us, found me on Facebook, and she realized that her spiritual dad had gone to be with Jesus. And so last December 21st, she emailed me, and we reconnected. And it was as if the 25 years had never passed. Uh, in February, her mom passed away. Her dad had a brain hemorrhage. <clears throat> And in March, she came to visit me in Ohio, and I challenged her to go to Kenya, and she said, I have a hundred reasons why I can't do that. And she sputtered and spurted for a while, and the Lord said, do you want to go? And she said, yes, and he said, you're going. <laughs> and she said, well, I, I, I'm a servant. She said, I'll scrub floors, and I'll carry people's stuff, and I'll wash feet, but I don't speak. And I said, in Kenya, they scrub floors for you. They carry things for you. You have to speak. And so for three weeks, Lou traveled with me to different locations with my wonderful driver, Mike. And the Lord had told Lou before they left, it was going to be a time of laughter for me because I had been not laughing too much since my husband passed away. And between Lou and Michael, I almost could hardly stand from the laughter. Um, we had wonderful time together. And... And Lou had been through some tough stuff as a kid. She was a, a, a sister of four brothers and a dad who, um, <clears throat> shall we say, wasn't the nicest guy on the block. And she had gone through a lot of difficult times. And she had forgiven her dad and walked forward. And before her dad passed away in May, she was able to minister to him in love. And when she shared that story in Kenya, so many of the women, particularly, had been used and abused and beaten and verbally abused in every way by their dads or men in their lives. And they just saw this, here's this Mzungu, this white lady, who really understands. And she made a hit. She's kind of at home wherever she goes. She's from Greene County, Virginia, and she talks just like you guys in North Carolina. In fact, you probably understand her better than I do. And, but I just want her to stand because uh, God has done some awesome things through her. I'm blessed. Her name's Lou Linda Hartman, Catherine Lou Linda Hartman. <clears throat> and my husband was the only one that ever called her Catherine. And in Kenya, my interpreter, Mary, and several of the other interpreters tried to say Lou, and they couldn't say Lou. It came out, you, Ru, but they couldn't say Lou, so they called her Catherine. But I'm blessed that, that not only has, uh, has she blessed my heart and my life, but we've reconnected. And when her mom died, and then in May her dad died, and her other spiritual dad died while she was in Kenya, she began to call me mom. And I got the best end of the deal. Because Lou has two daughters that I knew a long time ago when they were little girls. And now those girls are married and she has 11 grandchildren, which means I get two new daughters and 11 great grandchildren. I've got 16 great grandchildren and seven kids. I, am I happy? Whoo, yeah. So she comes with great benefits, but I told her that you have to go with me to North Carolina. And I'm kind of pulling her arm and already saying you, the Lord is telling you to come to Florida in, in June. So uh, y'all pray, please. <laughs> But uh, I'm blessed, and I thank you so much for praying. As you know, I had, uh, Lou and I both had severe food poisoning in Kenya while she was there, and then later I had typhoid, uh, and it was the worst case of typhoid I've had in 30 years. So without your prayers, I wouldn't survive. You were the only ones that connected, and the only ones that remind me and let me know that you were praying for me. And 
there there's no way that I can praise God enough for you you are so close to my heart and it's interesting how our brother was leading the singing and I saw him as he got up he was a little down and know that everybody struggles we're all going through stuff it's the way this crazy world is today and the Lord gave me a message last week that I thought I'd bring this morning and then about four o'clock this morning he said no that's not it and yet part of it is still it and it has a lot to do with with what our brother was sharing this morning um, I don't know what the Lord wants to do today I understand brother Phil has a lot on his heart um, we just want the Holy Spirit to rule and reign in this place whatever that looks like and so um, brother The first message that I had for today was from 2 Corinthians 12, 9. It says, his strength is made perfect in my weakness. And that's very true, as our brother shared this morning. But then for some reason, about 4 o'clock this morning, the Lord took me to the book of Habakkuk. Um, <laughs> it was one of my husband's favorite back, uh, books to, to preach. And I thought, oh dear, where is he when I need him? He's in heaven saying, honey, you got to do it this time. And uh, as we watch television and read the papers, we see that there's chaos and trouble, perverseness, destruction, violence, strife, contentions everywhere. The, the, uh, most of the ladies here have been to my conference and they know the things that I've shared about my life and my story and we see now how so much of that is coming to the surface in, in the world in America today. It's nothing new under the sun, absolutely nothing. It's the same old thing. And as we turn to Habakkuk we realize <laughs> that he was going through the same things. And like many people, he was overwhelmed by all that was going on. It's very easy, even as a believer, to become discouraged, depressed, and downhearted. And we know that the enemy's job is to make us feel that way. It's very easy for us as believers to miss the mark when we don't focus on what God wants to do in our hearts and lives. And in these days, we're seeing evil more and more and more. The enemy has been loosed. And believers are falling. Believers who do not have their eyes on Jesus and their focus on him are falling prey to whatever the enemy has. And the enemy knows our weaknesses. <clears throat> when I, I shared with Brother Carl and... Uh, and Dina and, and Danny and Brent, um, Wendy last night. When I came home from Kenya this time, the grief of having lost Richard May 2016 was greater than I had ever known. I think I sort of floated through the first year and we went back to Kenya. Lou and I even went to all the places that Rick and I had ministered and there was a lot of turmoil uh, in, in the ministry there. A lot of things I don't need to go into a lot of deception, a lot of people saying one thing and doing another, a lot of people trying to take advantage, a lot of perverseness. In one place that I went to do a um, leadership conference, I found out that there was another leadership conference in the home church that I had been a member of for 28 years. And the pastor that was leading that conference was living in adultery with a woman in the conference that I was teaching. And everybody knew. And yet he was asked to lead a conference, a leadership conference. Perfectly acceptable, okay? Justifiable. Not so. We have got to stand in these evil days. We cannot give the enemy 
and single opening. And I was sharing this morning with, with Wendy, one of the things I've had to really learn in my era of vulnerability as a new widow is discernment. What is it that God has for my life in the days ahead? What does he want for me? I cannot allow anything to divert me from the path that God has for me because he has a purpose for me. And that's the same for you. I don't care how old you are. I'm 78 years old. God has a purpose for my life. God has a purpose for your life. Philip, 13 years old. All the young people here, the ones in between. You're not done. The world is lost and dying and going to hell in a handbasket. And you cannot turn the television on or read the newspaper that you don't see the same things that Habakkuk was crying out to God about. My husband used to say in his message, he said, Habakkuk was on his knees so many times he was wearing out the knees of his trousers, begging God, what are you doing, God? What, what about, what's going on? Why don't you help? Crying out to him. And what happened? God sent the Chaldeans. And, and Habakkuk didn't understand. But God, where are you? Where are you in all this? Where is God in all this mess that we're in? He's on the throne. He is in charge. He hasn't missed a thing. We're the ones that miss. We're the ones that miss walking in the Spirit every minute of the day. And if we don't walk in the Spirit, we will fulfill the lust of the flesh. And in Galatians, it goes on to tell what those, the lust of the flesh is. I don't have to repeat it for you. You're Bible-believing people. But unfortunately, in most Christian churches around the world, around the country, we read into it, not out of it. When I went down to Virginia in September with Lou, I went to a mission board in Virginia that's been supporting a long time. Stopped in a hotel in Lexington, Virginia, because I was exhausted after my trip. And the night manager at the hotel came the next morning was sharing with me. He came from, actually from about 15 miles from where I live in Ohio. And he said, you know, he said, I've been down here seven years in this Bible Belt, Lexington, Virginia, just like North Carolina. And he said, I go to Bible studies with 25 or 30 people, and they'll read the Word of God, and God says this, thou shalt not, and God says you do this. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And he said, and they say, but, and they set out to justify their sin. I had a new young brother. Well, he's young in the Lord. He's old in stature. Just came to know the Lord out of the Catholic Church. He's on fire for the Lord. His wife passed away about six years ago. And he's, he didn't understand all about the word. And he came to a group of, of widows and widowers. And he began to share with me that he had had a relationship with a Christian lady, that he loved her spirituality, and, and she was wonderful. And he began to share, but, and, but we had a very close relationship. And he didn't miss any words about what that meant. He said, but I, in the eyes of God... We were married. I said, hold it. Hold it. And I called him on his sin. And I, I said, Lord, I'm stepping out in faith. And I'm going to tell him, you are justifying your sins. You need to fall on your face and confess because God has a plan for you and God wants to move you on. And until you confess that sin, you won't go anyplace. The enemy will eat you alive. Even though the relationship had been broken off, he was still justifying. And I said, no, sir, you fall on your face before the Lord and you confess your perverseness. You confess your sin. And he is faithful to just to forgive your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And this 70-year-old man, he lit up like a Christmas tree. He says, wow. He said, nobody ever said that to me. Nobody ever said that to me. He left organized religion in the, in the Catholic Church because he saw the falseness was going on. He was searching for Jesus. He'd never written down the day he had truly come to know the Lord. And I challenged him, write it down so the enemy can't, can't mess you up. And to watch this man grow is really awesome. In the grief group, there was also a man, 81 years old, a beautiful man. He lost his wife a year ago on his birthday. He'd been in a Baptist church in Ohio for many, many years. 
His wife had had multiple sclerosis for 45 years, and she passed away, and he's lost. He's struggling. He doesn't know what to do. The second meeting we had, he came to my home, and prior to that, I, I talked to him, and I gave him the four laws and challenged him on his salvation. He, he called me up, and he said, he said, well, you know, he said, I've done too many bad things. God won't like me. And I shared, of course, the love of Jesus and the mercy and grace of the Father to, to receive him unto himself. And he, he said, well, how long does it take to do that? <laughs> and I thought, his name's Bob. And I said, well, Bob, it's just a matter of you confessing Jesus as your Savior and open your heart and asking him in. And I ask you to pray for him because today he's at a home group. Our church has to meet three times a year out of the YMCA because they have swim meets. So there are 450 people in homes today, and I ask you to pray for Bob that he'll fall on his face because he is lonely, he's miserable, and he needs Jesus tremendously. And yet his pastor, in all the years in that church, had never challenged him to know Christ as his Savior. Can you believe that? And it was a good, solid evangelical church, supposedly. How many are out there? How many are here? I don't know all of you. The ones I know, I've heard your testimony. I mean, the love of Jesus shines through you. You welcome me like a long lost sister and I'm excited. But is there anybody here? I don't take it for granted that everybody here knows Jesus Christ as their savior or has without question committed their lives to the Lord. We can't play church anymore. The rubber has met the road. The world will eat us up and the enemy will destroy us if we're not walking in the spirit every day. It's a challenge. It's very difficult. Everybody has trials. Everybody has testings. There's not a person in this church that doesn't have something going on in their life. Everybody has a story. When I came home from Kenya, as I said, the grief hit me and I thought, I can't do this anymore. I, I'm sorry, Lord. I have stepped out in faith and gone to Kenya and I've served you and I went places and you gave me messages I'd never preached before to groups I'd never spoken to. I spoke to leaders. Mary, my interpreter, said, Jane, you're going to do a leaders conference for a whole day. And I said, I'm going to do what? And I thought, what do I do now? And I said, okay, Lord, what does the church look like? And he took me to the seven churches of Revelation. And the church looks just like it today. We've left our first love, like the church at Ephesus. We've tolerated evil. We have not spoken the truth in love. We're rich and we have need of nothing. Not only is that to the churches, but that's to the individuals. And the Lord wants us to fall on our face and cry out to him that his strength might be made perfect in our weakness. I love what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians. He, he didn't come to a church that was wealthy. He came to a church that was wealthy and knowledgeable. The church at Corinth, they were depending on their knowledge and their religiosity. But Paul didn't come and say, well, you know, I'm educated and I've got all this stuff and, and I'm the... No, he came and he said that Christ might be glorified. I come in my weakness. The body of Christ in many locations has it all wrong. And so people who have weaknesses don't dare say so. I remember as a young believer, I praise God for the day that Ed Carmichael led me to the Lord. He's in heaven with my husband and with Jesus now. Man of the word, knew the word backwards and forwards. He left the church and went to another church. And the church became a church of performance. You perform... You're saved by grace, but you've got to perform to be kept. Praise God, I'm saved by grace and I'm kept by grace. Yes. What I do and what I am and where I've been has nothing to do with Jesus paid it all. Yes. 
He nailed it all. All. A-L-L. The biggest word in the entire Bible. He nailed it all to the cross. Who I am. What I've done. Where I've been. My failures. My successes. My mistakes. My sins. And the body has forgotten that. We need people like you folks that don't just say, hallelujah, I'm here, I'm saved, hallelujah, and live like the devil. In Kenya, the American Peace Corps many years ago wrote a, a newsletter, and they said, well, how do I deal with people who come up to me and say, my name is, and I'm born again, I love Jesus, and then steal out of my back pocket? We give them a salvation, and it's the same thing in America. Salvation. Praise Jesus, you know. By grace you're saved. Pray this prayer and you'll know Jesus. We give them a little sprinkling of discipleship and we say, have at it. Have at the Christian life. And in Kenya, what happens? They mix tradition with it. They mix the culture with it. But what do we do? We mix, mix materialism. We mix what I want. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll be okay on Sunday. I'll come to church and I'll be okay on Sunday. And on Monday, I'm going to do exactly what I want. I mean, we may not say it, but that's exactly what we do. And, and Lord, I'll get back to you. Oh, I might go to prayer meeting on, you have Friday prayer meeting? You might go to prayer meeting on Friday because that looks good. But I'm going to run my life. <laughs> my husband was a lot like that when he was saved. He... Oh, he was in every position in the church. He preached. He did a wana. He was a deacon or elder. Um, you name it. Five or six jobs. And he loved the Lord. There was no question. But one day, the Lord said, Richard, present your body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to me, which is your reasonable service. And from the day that he did that, that's what he lived. And he literally gave his life on the project, having finished what God called him to do, presenting his earth suit, okay? Not just his heart, his mind, but his earth suit to the Lord. And that's what the Lord wants. He wants everything we have, everything we are. Habakkuk cried out to the Lord. He said, Lord, how long do I have to cry out to you for help? How long will you not hear me? How long do I have to cry to you about this violence and the junk that's going on? Junk is Jane's word, not King James. But the world is full of junk, if you didn't know it already. Uh, we wait for the next shoe to fall. What's happening next? Um, I think I told you before, but I'll repeat it again just in case. Um, I have a wonderful Messianic Jewish brother. He lives in Charlotte, actually. He has a ministry in uh, uh, Romania and in uh, Jerusalem, or in Israel. And he came out of communist Romania. His uncle was Richard Wormbrandt, the man who wrote Tortured for Christ. If you've never read it, I say read it. He was tortured in, for 14 years in solitary confinement. And Brother Ben is a very strong preacher. He, he's, he see, has, years ago saw what was happening in America and what was going on. And he saw that it was very much like what he had been through as a child when they had to escape from the communists. And normally at a missions conference, he would get up and he would share the word and he'd be strong. And several years ago at the missions conference, he was always the last speaker, so he, several years ago he stood up and he walked to the back of the congregation. He had his prayer shawl on his cap, which I can never can remember the name of that cap. And he pointed out, he said, church, wake up. Church, wake up. All the way back down the aisle. And I said, Ben, why didn't you tell them what you told Richard and me? He said, because the body of Christ is not ready to hear it. And when I read Brother Phil's book on deception, I thought, oh my goodness. We are 
a, a body of believers that have been totally deceived. And for a long time, a long, long time, I'd be in churches and I'd, I'd say, what's wrong with me? That how can I be right and all of them wrong? And then I came to North Carolina. First, my brother counselor was sharing with me that the, the, the situation in the body of Christ, he'd been a pastor for 35 years, and he has stood by me and his wife has stood by me through this time and for 11 years now. And I was like, well, he's so smart. and He's got his PhD and his THD and heaven only knows what other kinds of HDs. And yet I've been, I'm listening to him. What's, what's the issue? And then I come to North Carolina and I thought, uh-huh. There are a few people here that believe that same thing. The deception is out there. And the body of Christ has been deceived. God is choosing out a remnant, Brother Phil's words. God's words, but Phil repeated that in his book, Light and Darkness. Where do we stand? Born again? Run my own life? Don't know God's purpose for me? Where does the body stand? There are a few that are crying out like Habakkuk. God, where are you in this mess? Where are you, Lord? And the Lord's just saying, in my time. In my time. But are we living for the Lord every day? Are we committed to him? Is what we are doing because we love Jesus? Brothers, you stood up here and you sang. There wasn't anybody else in this room but you and Jesus. And that blessed my soul. And that's what I see when your choir sings. I tell everybody, I said, these folks down there, they sing like a unit, but everyone's worshiping God all, as if they're all alone. And it is beautiful. Where is your heart? Where's my heart? Scripture says the heart's deceitful above all and desperately wicked. Who can know it? What a young man in Kenya, when I went through some problems, the Lord brought four young men into my life that I'd known for many years. Uh, they knew things that, that I didn't know how to do, that Richard knew how to do. And it was as if the Lord took a scarlet thread and ran it through each one of them and brought one from Rwanda back into my life. And one, did, one helped with this and one helped with that. And then wrapped me around with that scarlet cord. And the one young man that my husband had uh, had spoken to a group in, in Ken, uh, Dorcas Aid International. And many years ago, they had educated him. He'd become a counselor. And he'd been through a lot of stuff. It's a long story, but he loves the Lord. And he's in Rwanda now ministering to, to the families of the genocide. And he sat there and listened to me. And he said, Jane, what do you want? I thought, what do I want? And I said, I want to do the will of the Father, and I want to know the heart of God. And he said, that's exactly what I wanted to hear. Do you want to do the will of the Father? Do you want to know the heart of God? In the day of Habakkuk, justice and righteousness didn't happen. Read the paper. <laughs> Read this morning's headlines. The Chaldeans had taken over and were perverse. And Habakkuk was calling on the Lord to say, help in this perverse, wicked generation. And the Chaldeans are terrible people. They laughed in the face of kings. They mocked. Sound familiar? Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely, and we're seeing it everywhere. And, I, and somebody says, oh, you're so negative. No, I'm not negative. I'm praising the Lord. It's not negative to be informed, because when we're not informed, 
then God can't deal with our heart of the perverseness and the sin in our lives. It's so easy. It is so easy to say, oh, boy, look at that person and what they're doing and look at the TV and say, oh, my goodness, all those terrible people. How easy is it to look in the mirror? Years ago, I went through a major depression from 1978 to 81. I had done all the things the legalists told me I should do to be spiritual, and I failed miserably. I said, God, I've done all I can do. I'm laying in my bed in Fredericksburg, Virginia, my daughter, my husband went off to church. I had the pills in my hand. I said, I'm done. I quit. And the Lord said, no, you didn't. You can't. And he led me to some good stuff. But I had gone to the pastor's wife, and I cried out. I said, I don't know what's wrong with me. I've done everything I know. Somebody help me. She wrote me a letter and said, Jane, you're a mean, nasty, angry woman. I thought, well, that's nice. Thank you. I went to my husband. He's taking a nap. And I went to who does she think she is to tell me I'm a mean, nasty, angry woman? He said, honey, you are. I said, oh, dear. And the Lord began to show me what was in my heart. And the Lord began to do a work. It's a journey, guys, ladies and gentlemen. Not guys, you're beautiful ladies and wonderful gentlemen. It's a journey. Every day of the journey until Jesus takes us home, we've got to commit our lives to the Lord. We've got to fall on our face and cry out to God like Habakkuk did. Sometimes in our life, it seems as if God is like he was to Habakkuk. He's strangely silent. We pray and we pray and we pray and... Nothing seems to happen. Some months ago, <clears throat> dear friends of mine in, in Lebanon, some folks, that, her history is a lot like mine. Her husband was very much like my husband. And they had helped a lot on the house that was redone for us. And um, she said, well, it looks like my husband's job is coming to an end and we don't know what we're supposed to do. And I said, well, let's just pray about it. In three weeks, his boss said, I'm moving. In two days, the boss sold his house. The next day, he said, I'm sorry, your job is finished. The following day, his uncle called from Iowa and said, I have a house here for you and a job for you. When are you coming back to Iowa? And I thought, their names are Loy and Roy. Okay. I said, you know what? I've been praying a long time. And you pray for two weeks? <laughs> And the Lord showed up, and they're now in Iowa. How long until the Lord answers? Be still and know that I am God. And it's very hard. I, I love what, um, I think I said this when I was here before, I love what Elizabeth Elias said about, um, about waiting on the Lord. And it's like... Um, when we are looking for white water experiences and the Lord is leading us beside still waters, it's hard to believe he's doing anything. Where are you in your journey? Are you struggling? Are you resting? Are you waiting patiently? Are you walking in sin? The church doesn't talk much about sin the blood anymore. You know, it's, that's politically incorrect. <laughs> The Lord talks about it all the time, doesn't he? All have sinned and come short of the Lord of God, glory of God. And if I don't fall on my face every single day and confess my sin to him, then I can't walk in the spirit. I can't be the person he wants me to be and go where he wants me to and do what he wants me to do. If I don't fall on my face like Paul and say, Lord, all this mess is going on. All this stuff is going on, and he was persecuted. He had snake bite. The brothers turned against him. He was shipwrecked. And he fell on his face, and he said, But, Lord. But, Lord. There's strength in my weakness. And every one of us is weak, and Americans don't like to talk about being weak. 
We, you know, we go to the gym to get strong. We strut like we're strong. We're in charge. But who are we? Hmm? Who are we not to fall on our faces and say, God, what do you have for me? Young people. Young people. It's a messy world out there. And I know your parents are praying for you every day. Fall on your face every minute. Let your hearts stay tender. And those young folks in the middle, those between, say, what, 35 and 60, you're young, okay? You just live in life. I have an example of a, of a friend top of his career, top of the money scale, has everything going for him, wonderful wife, wonderful family. He came to know the Lord as a young person. He's had many troubles in his life. He had an accident some years ago. He's in constant pain. Can't take medication for the pain because he's a pilot. pilot in a very high position. And for a while he trusted the Lord. And then he, God didn't do it his way. God didn't take the pain away. God didn't do this. God didn't do that. And now when I talk with him, I say, how's it going? He says, I'm living life. Are you just living life? Get up, go to work, go to school. Wrestle with the problems, wrestle with the Lord, or not. <laughs> Are you sold out for Jesus Christ? Is there sin in your life that you need to confess? In Habakkuk's day, the... The, the, the rich and the wealthy, and we see the same thing today. They, they're greedy. They want more. They search for more, and they find it doesn't satisfy. There's an old song somewhere. I'm sure a brother knows it. Nothing satisfies like Jesus. And why are we so empty-headed that we think, it's okay, we can handle this, we've got it. This will satisfy me, that will satisfy me. Uh, my, my husband used to give a testimony. He said, for a long time, I thought a, a bigger car, bigger house, bigger wife. That was satisfying. And he said, I found out, no, it was only Jesus is satisfied. And when he committed his life, that's when he was satisfied. And he received the well done, good and faithful servant. You know, when we point to you, I've got three at me. What are you going to receive? You're going to receive the well done? Or are you just living life? And sometimes when I come here, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir because you guys seem to have it all together. You seem to have a corner on the market of the, love, the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, kindness, meekness, and temperance. All rolled into one church. And I'm like, whoa. But you know what? I'm sure that there are those right here that aren't there. Um, we don't have time. In Hebrews, it talks about just a little while, the Lord will come. Where will we be when he comes? What will we be doing? I'd like for him to come right now so we could just all go to heaven and keep on doing this. It'd be pretty cool. But what are we going to do in the meantime? In Habakkuk and in Hebrews, it said, the just shall live by faith. I'm great on acronyms. Faith, forsaking all, I trust Jesus. And believe me, in the past 19 months, I've learned a lot. Um, as I said, when I came back from Kenya... The grief was so heavy, I don't even think I called Carl and Dina. I didn't talk to anybody. 
I thought, I'm not going to make this. There were times I wasn't sure I wanted to make it. I couldn't think straight. It was like it overwhelmed me to a point where it's more than I can take. The loneliness was devastating. And it kind of sounds kind of funny. I shared last night what the Lord did. But um, over the years in Kenya, Richard and I have had four beautiful ridgeback dogs. They're incredible animals. Three of them were Richard's. The fourth one that came into our life from the Kenyan SPCA was my dog from the very first minute. We brought him home. He's, he was wonderful. He was about 103 pounds of solid muscle. A little old guy, that would, a big old guy that kind of lay around the house and was a warm body. And about six weeks ago, I had to put that dog down. And I thought I was going to die. In fact, I wanted to die. Not because of the dog, but all of the grief that had been poured in me, all the stress, all the trauma, all the everything that I'd been through in the past months brought me on my face as the doctor injected that dog. And I had a period of time for about an hour. I had amnesia. It was such an incredible blow. Not the dog, but the piled up grief and stress in my life and it was like the pressure cooker lid blew off and praise God since then I have had a peace in my heart that only God could bring but every minute of every day he says are you going to live by faith are you going to discern my will for your life what do you want to do the will of the Father and know the heart of God God keep me from sinning keep me from fulfilling any lust of my flesh any in any direction and sometimes it'd be easy you know it's nice to be treated like a lady but I will not in Jesus name allow anything to steer me away from the purpose of God in my life and his will and his heart I pray that every one of you is in the same place. I pray that you're there, that whatever is in your life, stop justifying your sin. It's so easy. But Lord, you know, it's really okay. Um, I mean, you know, I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. But Lord, you said do this, but it's okay. And God cries out and says, no, it's not okay. You cannot become the person God created you to be if you have unconfessed sin in your life. You cannot become the person God created you to be until you're willing, by faith, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, walk in the Spirit moment by moment. Trusting and believing in the grace of God, not only for salvation, but the grace to walk in this crazy, mixed up, perverse world. In Machakos, Kenya, years ago, over a little bush hotel, there was a sign that said, Although the whole world is mad, it's the degree of madness that matters. And we're getting more mad every day. And so many Christians are just live in life talk in the talk but not walk in the walk and just like Habakkuk I'm sure that the Lord is crying out what are you going to do how long are we going to pretend how long are we going to have one foot in what we want to do and one foot in the kingdom in the world it's difficult days as I said, everybody in here has a little red wagon. They're pulling something. And I love the song. The minute I put my feet on the floor, how'd it go? How'd that song go, brother? <laughs> he wakes me up. Well, first thing I do is coffee, but I, I love the song that said he wakes me up and, and I put my feet on the floor, and, the, and that's what it's about. Uh, do you know what God wants for you? You know God's will for your life? You know the purpose you were born? 
He said, he knew you in your mother's womb before the foundation of the earth. He said, I know the plans I have for you to prosper you and not to harm you. That's okay, Lord. I'll get back to your plan later. I challenged Lou to go to Kenya. And I told her what I had told you some time ago and what I said at a conference years ago. I know the plans I have for you to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. And then the Lord said, you tell them, unless by faith, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, they're willing to get out of their comfort zone. They'll never know to the fullest the plan that God has for them. Life is a great adventure. Are you just living life? You smile on your face. You hug the brethren. It's so cool. It's so warm. It's so wonderful. You come here and it's great. Raise your hands and pray. In many churches, pastor will give an invitation. Anybody wants deliverance, come forward this morning. Come forward and see, receive the Lord's deliverance. People go forward by the hundreds. Next Sunday, anybody wants to see deliverance, come forward. Same people go forward. What is it in your life, in my life, that God wants to deliver us from so that we can walk in this perverse generation? What is it? God is merciful. He's full of grace, undeserved merit. And because of him, he says, we as believers, we are, we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Not will become, can become if we do the right thing, but we are. And he says, if you confess your sins and you're faithful and just to forgive your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive your sins, and he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And you're right back at that place of the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus in a second. It's, our hearts are hard. The key to power is the grace and strength in our weakness. The Lord says in Philippians 3.10, James Version, if you want to know the power of the Holy Spirit, you must go through the fellowship of his sufferings. <gasps> we don't want to suffer. We think it's, and this, oh, brother will know in Kenya that this, um, not easy believism, what is it? They're preaching the gospel that's not true. Um, thank you. The word wouldn't come. Sometimes I lose them. Prosperity ministry is destroying. You know, you do this, this, and this, and this, and you will prosper, and you, no, that's not what we're here for. We're here to exemplify the love of Jesus in and through the trials and testings that he brings in our life to conform us to the image of Christ. You know, we're so quick to quote Romans 12, 1 and 2. All things work together for the good that loves the Lord to those who are called according to his purpose. But we forget. We forget. And in, in, in Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good. If I had... $10 for every time somebody has said that to me in the last 19 months, I would be wealthy. But why do they work together for good? We forget verse 29. Chain's version. Because God's in the business of conforming us to the image of Christ. And I used to use an example. I may even have used it here. I don't know. But when I was first started teaching, Jesus is like a perfect circle. No beginning and no end. And we get saved, we're like a cube. And how do you get the cube to become the perfect circle? You've got to cut off a few edges. Some of us, it only takes an emery board. Just shave it off and, oh, that's all done. That part's round, I'm good. I'm conforming to the image of Christ. Others, it takes a saw. Sometimes it takes a wood rasp. And some people, it takes a hatchet. But he says in Philippians, he's begun a good work in us and he will perform it. And if we are not walking in the spirit every day, bless God, he is going to bring a hatchet. Allow a hatchet in your life. 
And the person that I mentioned earlier said to me, well, this happened and that happened. The other person did this and I made a mistake here and I made a mistake there. I said, ho, ho, do all things work together for good in a Christian's life or do they not? I said, do you think that me losing my husband of 58 years feels like it's going to work together? I said, you bet no. But he said it does. I believe it does. It will. In Jesus' name. And I hope God is my witness. I don't ever want to be the hatchet variety ever again in my life. I want to be so tender before the Lord that he goes, and that conforms me. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Seeing as we're compassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us and look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and despising the shame. We confess our sin sometimes when we feel like it. Do you lay aside the weights? Are you dragging weights? I dragged a lot of weights a long time. I've been saved 55 years this coming February. And believe me, I've been in church for years. It was preached if you weren't in church every time the church door was open, the same as committing adultery. And man, I was there. But I was dragging weight the whole time. And 11, 12 years ago, God began to heal my heart. I shared with the ladies all about that. God healed my heart of junk in my history. And they've, they've, one of the Christian statements with my counselor friend that teaches all over the world. Now he, he, go, he and his wife go all over the world ministering to people who minister to used and abused children in, every, in the sex trade, in life, in whatever. And one of the things that they have learned, it's a very simple phrase, there are two of them. One of them is using the word cuts as an acronym. Chronic, trauma unpredictable, traumatic stress destroys. Chronic, unpredictable, traumatic stress destroys. And the other one is that your biology, that your biography determines your biology. Unless Jesus intervenes, cleanses your heart, and sets you on the right path. And you walk in the spirit on a daily basis. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy is set before him. And I can truthfully tell you, I have the joy of the Lord in my heart. And the joy of the Lord is my strength. And I miss my husband like crazy. But you know what? I am so excited about what God is doing. I have no clue what it is. And Brother Carl corrected me this morning because last night I told him I had my foot in the air waiting for the Lord to show me the next place to put it. And he said, Jane, put your foot down. <laughs> Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. It's right. I don't have to have my foot in the air because as I yield my heart, I present my body as a living sacrifice every day of my life, every minute. I want the will of the Father in my life and I want to know the heart of God. As I do that, I don't have to worry about having my foot in the air because he's just going to pick me up and put me where he wants me. And he's going to do what he wants to do in me and through me. Where are you in that picture? Some of us older folks who maybe are widows and widowers at this point. We kind of think we know, you know, maybe life's kind of done and I'm just going to hang out till Jesus comes and not do much. You're still breathing, aren't you? God has a purpose. God has a purpose for you every minute of every day. That young person in the store, that, that 
that woman or person at the checkout, look at the pain in their heart. We're so, we go with blinders on. We've lost compassion. The world's dying. Are we going to be the ones that are going to keep them out of heaven because of our testimony? Oh, well, they do the same thing I do. Why should I believe in Jesus? Rick had a guard at Nairobi Hospital say that to him one time. All of his buddies had come to know the Lord. Rick had given a Bible and a, and a four laws in their, in their uh, vernacular translation. And Rick went to this one guy and he says, well, don't you want to receive the Lord as your Savior? He says, why should I? And he, Rick said, what do you mean? He said, well, all those guys you say you've led to the Lord, they say they've led to the Lord, but the buns have been Christians for a long time. They're doing the same thing I am. Why should I receive Jesus? How many people we kept out of, he out of heaven because of our testimony, because of our lack of commitment? How many Christians today are involved in the perverse generation? I've got a ton of statistics I could give you, but I won't this morning. You probably know. Every person in this room, you are precious in the sight of the Lord. If you don't know him, today is your day of salvation. If you do know him, today is your day to present your body as a living sacrifice that God may show you what he wants for you. If you're walking in sin, Involved in sin, any sin. One's no greater than the other. We have a lot of Christians that have a proud look. What does the Lord say about a proud look in, in Proverbs? He hates a proud look above a murderer. Every day we need to fall on our face and say, oh my God, my sin nailed you to the cross. I confess the sin of my heart and the sin of my life. Help me to understand your will and to know your heart. And thank you, thank you that I am already the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. <sighs> you ever thought about that? Whew. I'm anything but righteous in my own eyes and I'm a human being, I mess up every day. But the almighty everlasting father says that you as a believer are already the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Do you trample on that? Do you put that under your feet and say, okay, I'll get back to you later. I'll do my thing. Mm -mm. God is in the business of conforming you to the image of Christ. He will. He began the work in you. He will continue it. If you're having troubles, Praise God. Praise God. I don't like them either, but you know what? I know what he's doing with them. I know what he's doing. He's just conforming me because he loves me. He loves you. One of the greatest songs ever, ever, ever written. Jesus loves me. This I know. Where is your love for him? Have you left your first love? Are you tolerating sin? Are you rich and you have need of nothing? Brother, I feel so... Um, blessed and humbled to stand here. I know who I am, but I also know who loves me. And I know it's by his grace I'm saved. And it's by his grace I am kept. And it's by his grace that he will, will keep his promises in my life and in your life. Thank you for allowing me to, to stand in this place. This is holy ground. And I'm blessed that you've loved me. You've prayed me through many things. And when I walk in that door, I, last night I walked in the restaurant, met <laughs> Carl was standing at the door, and I hugged him, and I ran to Dean, and I thought, oh my gosh, I'm coming home. <laughs> 
And it's, and it's hard for me to stand here and say the things I said this morning. That's not easy. But it's a responsibility that God has given me. And I did the same thing. And God, God gave me the grace in Kenya because they were heading for an elections. And I stood and they, they were praying. And I said, you're praying, that's fine. If my people who are called by my name will hum, humble themselves and seek my face and pray. And they stopped there. Didn't repent of their sins. And there's still some chaos going on there. It's not settled. My people who call by my name will humble themselves and seek my face and pray and turn from their sin. I will heal their nation and heal their lives. By God's grace, fall on your face in weakness that he might make you strong. I love you guys. God bless you.